Then, then comes, you know, facial nerve is an integral part related with the ear. So, for me, ear examination, 50% of the ear examination is not complete if you have missed the facial nerve. And facial nerve, how can we check clinically? It supplies the muscles of facial expression of the face. So we have to check the facial nerve by muscles of facial expression. How? You can go for, for the frowning of the forehead. Ask them to look upwards and you can see the frowning on both sides. Then close the eyes forcefully. And then try to open it. Okay. Then check the nasolabial thick. Nasolabial folds, then ask him, and then try to tap it. As a okay, then whistle. Okay, so this is how you will check the muscles of facial expression. You have to check the symmetry of the nasolabial fold on paralyzed side. Paralyzed side, there will be no nasolabial fold. He could not be able to close the eyes. There will be you know no frowning on that side in lower motor neuron lesions. And then there comes the clinical difference between lower motor neuron lesion and upper motor neuron lesion. When we will be discussing facial nerve paralysis, we will talk about in detail. Because in lower motor neuron lesion, whole half of the face on ipsilateral side is involved. While in upper motor neuron lesions, lower half of the contralateral side is involved. Upper half is spared in that due to the bilateral representation. Then, so this was about hearing as far as the physiology of ear is concerned. Hearing we checked it with tuning forks. We checked the mobility of the tympanic membrane. We checked the functions of the facial nerve. Now which function of the ear is left behind? Vestibular, vestibular apparatus. So what will be the symptom of vestibular disorder? Vertigo. Vertigo is a symptom. And what is the sign? Sign for vestibular disorder? Nystagmus. So nystagmus is a sign and vertigo is a symptom. Okay? So, and what is nystagmus? Sorry? What do you mean by the word to and fro? In common English, what do you mean by to and fro? Not focused on a particular point. Sorry? Not focused toward... Uh, Basically, this is involuntary oscillatory movements of the eyeball. Because if, for example, if I start moving my eyeballs like this, this is voluntarily. So this is not a nystagmus. Involuntary oscillatory movements of the eyeball, those are called as nystagmus. Okay? Then nystagmus, just like hearing loss, it can be, you know, central or it can be peripheral and on nystagmus we can differentiate between central nystagmus and peripheral nystagmus how to check it now how to check it so just ask the patient to stabilize the head don't move the head and he should follow the movement of your fingers with eyes only okay if he could not follow your instruction properly even you can stabilize his head with your hand and then ask him now you are roughly at a 30 meter distance, so 15, 20 centimeter away from the you know eyes of the patient, your finger will be, and you will ask the patient to follow the movement of the eyes uh, according to your finger movements. You will go here, you will stay here for a few milliseconds, then you will come in the midline, you will stay here again. Continuously looking into the eyes of the patient. Then on the other side. Again you will stay there. Then you will come here again in the midline, neutral position, stay here. Then you move upwards. Again stay there. Then comes in the midline, stay here. Then downwards. Stay there for a few milliseconds. Then come in the midline. Again, stay there and then you will finish and then ask the patient, Aapko Did you feel dizzy in any movements? Okay? This is how you will check. In ophthalmology, they will tell you about the field of vision. Don't confuse it with the field of vision. If you would have noticed it, that my fingers have not gone too far. 
okay roughly they say some books have written 35 degree 30 to 35 or maximum is 45 degree angle so the circle is 45 degree angle in which or in other words for example i just explain it a bit in detail that for example if i go the moment the limbus of this eye it touches the lateral canthus that will be the limit of my finger i will not go beyond that because if i go beyond that due to the nasal bridge patient would not be able to see with this eye my finger so diplopia will be there and when diplopia is there automatically dizziness is there isn't it similarly if i go upwards if i go too much what will happen the eyeballs will roll i would not be able to look for the eyeball movements similarly if i go too down his upper eyelids will be covering the eyeballs i could not see the movements of the eyeballs isn't it so i have to go just between 45 degree radius not beyond that in field of vision you are looking forward and then still whatever is so there is maximum you know movements the ophthalmology people will tell you the students get confused they do field of vision here in ENT and when they go there they do just very limited movements so make it a point and clarify it now so this is nystagmus then what is the difference between characteristics of central nystagmus or peripheral nystagmus clinically we will describe it in some other day then comes Romberg's sign. You see, this is maintenance of balance is a reflex arc. And in any reflex arc, there is an efferent limb, efferent. Then is central connections, and then is efferent limb. Isn't it? For maintenance of balance, the efferent limb consists of sensory input from three systems. One, of course, is the vestibular system of the ear, inner ear. And that vestibular system consists of utricle and secule and three semicircular canals. Then sensory input for maintenance of balance is from eyes. And the third one is from your locomotor system. So these from your joints, from your spine position, from your neck position, this locomotor system, muscles, they give these sensations to maintain the balance or a proper position. 70% is from locomotor system, 15% is from vestibular apparatus, 15% is from the eyes. To maintain a balance, two out of these three sensory inputs should be intact. Even if one is not working, still one can maintain the balance. And very good example for that is blind people you see blind people still they can walk they can maintain the balance if some other abnormality is not there because two other systems are okay but similarly during swimming you know different postures are being attained by the swimmers there the gravity is not working that much so locomotor system sensations they are less or they are not working properly but due to the vestibular apparatus and eyes still he can maintain the balance so point is two out of these three sensory inputs if they are intact still one can maintain the balance if we have to check it and we are suspecting for example some ear problem and sensory input from other sensory input if we vanish it and then we can see that what happens that's what is the background for the Romberg's test okay so this is how you have to and during this procedure all the time you have to guard your patient because you don't know on which side the patient can fall down so you have to safeguard your patient okay so I have simply for example if I am suspecting that he has got some problem in this ear so it means from this ear the sensory input of our balance is not working okay but still he can maintain the balance so from the eyes and from his sensory input from locomotor system 
Now I just simply have asked him to close the eyes. It means there is no sensory input from the eyes now. And if he could not maintain the balance, and he will sway. If this ear is involved, he will sway towards me. If he is having problem on other side, he will sway towards other side. Then our diagnosis, clinical diagnosis, will be confirmed, isn't it? Other way is so this time I am suspecting ear disease. Eyes are open, but I have asked him to lift the limb so that the sensory input from this side it has gone. So if he has got a problem with the ear as well, sensory input from this side has gone, he will sway towards me. Okay? And similarly on other side. So this is what we call as rhombus. And when for lymphatic drainage, as far as ear is concerned, that is not that much important, but just to complete, we have to go for especially in the external aortic canal infections, or there can be, you know, lymph node involvement, pre-auricular as we saw, post-auricular lymph nodes may be involved in those infections. So we have to check the neck for lymph nodes as we did in nasal examination. Again, because our patient is exposed up to the tip of the shoulder, so just very gently you will do the superficial palpation. Patient is exposed up to the tip of the shoulder. And then with the pulp of the fingers, a deep palpation for different neck lymph nodes. Submental, submandibular, upper deep cervical, pre-auricular, post-auricular. He will be asked to flex the neck so that sternocleidomastoid is relaxed along the sternocleidomastoid anterior border. We have to do the deep palpation. So middle deep cervical, lower deep cervical, pre-tracheal, pre-laryngeal, and at the same time with the thumbs, you will go for suboccipital. Once you are completed, you will go for supraclavicular. And with that, you will redrape your patient, and you will say thank you very much. And that completes our ES examination. Okay? Any questions?